Hi friends, I have said many times that not everything I do issue as a video. Many of my works remain behind the scenes for one reason or another. I have previously published a couple of such works which I considered uninteresting to the general public, because these are all sorts of narrowly focused devices that I am often asked to develop. But judging by the comments under the video, people are interested in this, so here is another such video. A good friend approached me with a request to make automation for controlling pumps. The technical task is as follows. These are two separate tanks with pumps that are constantly being filled. As soon as the water reaches a certain level, the reed switches that are installed inside the tanks are triggered. The reed switches should activate the pumps for a certain time of about 1.5 to 2 minutes, and then the pumps turn off. This process is repeated in a cycle. You will say that any time relay can handle such a task, but it is not so simple. Firstly, the device being developed must be triggered by a certain signal, in this case read switches. Secondly, these are normally closed read switches, that is, in the rest mode, their contacts are closed and the pumps must be activated when their contacts open. In addition, the circuit must be noise resistant and not react to the contact bounds of the read switch in a word, must be reliable and trouble-free in operation. One triggering of the read switch should start circuit and it doesn't matter whether the read switch contacts will close or there is contact bounds. The circuit should work clearly for about 2 minutes and automatically turn off. We need two such systems with a single power supply on one board. I think the task is clear and it seems like everything is simple. Well, now I will show you what and how much time required to solve this simple problem. I have been assembling circuits for similar tasks of varying complexity for several years, and when it is necessary to do sequential commands, there is nothing simpler, cheaper and better than the good old NE555 microcircuit. Someone will say, use a microcontroller. I will answer, there is absolutely no point in it. It is more expensive than a 555 timer, it is more complicated and the repairability is reduced to zero if the controller burns out and the person who wrote the firmware is unavailable. Timer 555 is sold everywhere after all. It is the most popular microcircuit and its functionality is more than enough to perform the task set. Also, the project doesn't need a display and precise settings. First, I sketched out the diagram in a simple simulator. And then we selected the component values, opened the timer's technical documentation, found the monostable mode circuit, then the formulas for the time calculating. That seemed we finished with the values. Then we open sprint layout and draw a printed circuit board. After several hours of monotonous work, we got this board and in my opinion it's well thought out because everything is beautiful, neat and there are no jumpers. Oh sorry, there is one at the back side. At this stage, the circuit has not yet been drawn. But I decided to make the switching a little more modern. I decided not to use electromagnetic relays, as I had originally planned and agreed with the client, but make more durable and solid state. I have a bunch of 25A thyristors from immemorial times. I will install them. And the timer will control them through optothyristors. Thus, we will get full galvanic isolation of mains part from the low voltage one. By the way, I also added optocoupler PC817 on the input part where the read switch is connected, so everything is correct. These thyristors are powerful, reliable and in theory with such a load as low power pump, they will not heat up, so they are installed directly on the board without radiators. I also provided milled sections where necessary so that the spark wouldn't suddenly jump but wouldn't ignite an arc. The load is inductive after all. After finishing the board, I realized that I was too old to drill so many holes with a small drill. I have a drilling machine and I can use it, but why if I have a CNC router? We stick reinforced double-sided adhesive tape onto the board and place it under CNC for drilling holes. Next, we change the drill to a milling cutter and mill where necessary. To be honest, I had an emergency situation related to the fact that I forgot to mirror the board template and was forced to make a new board. Well then, we take out the board and, in the old-fashioned way, print out the template on a printer and transfer it to the surface of the foil with a laminator or iron. Uninformed people will write, 
What a fool, he has an engraver and he does everything to old-fashioned way. Eh, I usually make small boards on the engraver, but with medium and large boards the process will take forever if you need to mill a large amount of copper layer, as in this case, and there will also be a lot of dust. For the same reason, I don't cut the board along the contour on the CNC with the exception of boards of complex shape. Ordinary metal scissors and muscle power cope with the task hundreds of times faster than this particular CNC machine. By the way, this is the popular 3018 model. After aligning the template with the holes, I had a small problem with this. Transferring the template to the foil and etching, you have a finished board in your hands. To make everything even more beautiful, you can print silk screen and apply it to the PCB in the same way. You can make a solder mask and tin the exposed copper with liquid tin. In general, do it like at the factory, but we will leave all this to our sponsor, the next PBC company, which manufactures high quality printed circuit boards for your DIY projects and more. Factory production on high precision machines guarantees high quality of boards of any complexity, size and number of layers. A large selection of solder mask colors, track coating, PCB and copper thickness, a bunch of additional options ensure that your board meet the highest standards and international directives. Next PCB has a huge component library, a convenient online Gerber viewer, discounts and nice bonuses for new customers. They offer favorable prices and many delivery methods directly from China. You will find a link to NextPCB in the description. After all this, the painstaking assembly process begins. We carefully check all components before soldering, including microchips. And this is what the finished board looks like. Next, I draw a circuit especially for you and let's look at it. These are our normally closed read switches. A closed read switch keeps the bottom transistor closed and when it is closed, the other transistor is closed too. If the read switch contacts open, the first transistor will immediately trigger and open the second. Through the second transistor, power will be supplied to the optocoupler LID, and its internal transistors will open, sending a trigger signal to the NE555 microcircuit. The countdown will begin. The time depends on the values of the specified components and can be changed by rotating the trimmer resistor. During this period, a high level is set at the timer output, and the optosemester LED lights up. By analogy with the optocoupler, the internal triac will operate and open the main power triac, which supplies power to the pump. I recommend using optosemester with zero switching. These are the ones shown in the circuit, although I used regular ones with switching at any time. There is simple protection against polarity reversal at the power input. The diode is justified here because the circuit's current consumption is small. There is a power indicator as well as indicators for timer operation. After assembly, the testing stage begins. The operating modes, the circuit's resistance to interference, false alarms, etc. as well as operation with a load are checked. I must note that regardless of the state of the read switch's contacts, after power is supplied to the circuit, the timers will not work. And this is important. At the end, the board was covered with varnish on both sides, which will provide dust and moisture protection. I will also point out that the sine wave is practically not distorted. Of course, the moments of opening and closing of the triac are visible, but the duty cycle as a whole is about 49.8%, which is an ideal indicator. It works with any loads without problems. By the way, the pumps that will be connected to this device are low power, about 60 to 80 watts per channel, so no need to explain that the triac has a colossal current reserve. At the very last stage, I turned on my 3D printer, which I upgraded to this state, and printed the device case. I think it turned out pretty well, done from the start to finish by one person, or rather two, thanks to my beloved wife, who once in a couple of days completely mastered this machine both in terms of programs and mechanics. I am pleased with the work done. It was interesting and exciting. Of course, it isn't worth talking about the profitability of such developments, even despite their childish simplicity, this is a simple thing and has a small cost. But in my case, there was also a motive in the form of creating a video which came to an end. If you liked it, then don't forget to rate it with a like, this like is still not visible and if you are into electronics, you can visit my other channel, all links are in the description.
Now, I say goodbye until next time, with you, as always, was Cassian TV.